Bibles with you, please open them to the book of 1 Peter chapter 5. Amen. If you're here for the first time, we want to welcome you. If you come the second time, we don't welcome you anymore because you're part of the family. We welcome you if you're first time visitors. might seem a little kind of strange or weird to you what's going on, but I'll tell you, when I got saved, I knew nothing about Pentecost. I knew nothing about Jesus. I knew nothing about anything. And uh, <clears throat> my neighbor uh, is the one that led me to Christ, and I got saved. And then he took me to this wild, you think we're wild, took me to a wild Pentecostal church. And my God, I thought I was, I want to run out of there. I said, these people are crazy. And then I became one of them. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. I know Priscilla means about the mission field and, you know, I've been to Guatemala three or four times. I've been to China. I've been to Nigeria three times, India twice, Mexico, Mexico rather. Been to Canada, been around for Jesus. And I'll tell you, it gets scary at times. But when you know that the Lord is sending you, you, you don't have to fear anything. And uh, my last trip to Nigeria, I had just left one city when uh, the police called the pastor and said, please, make sure you check every vehicle that comes in the compound because they're bombing churches now in Nigeria. So um, people said, aren't you afraid? I said, no, I kissed my wife before I left. You know, my wife knows when I go on a mission field, it could be the last time she sees me. But I'll tell you one thing, I've been back ever since. And, you know, sometimes the devil says, oh, if you go and you do that, I'm going to kill you. I said, if you don't shut up, I'll go to five more countries. How do you like that? <laughs> okay. Because I'm not afraid to die because I know where I'm going. See, death is just a doorway. You just go from one place to another. And it depends on where you go is where, 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 where your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Night, Life or Not. And so anyway, let's turn in your Bibles, please, <clears throat> to 1 Peter chapter 5. Starting with verse 7. If you don't have a Bible with you, there will be the scriptures up on the screen for you. If you'd like to have a Bible afterwards, there's uh, Brother Pastor Tom is in the back there running the video this morning. Um, if you would like, you can see him and he'll give you a Bible absolutely free. It's amazing how many people don't want God's word. You know why they don't want God's word? Because they don't want to be accountable. But you're accountable. We live in a nation that was founded on God, that has moved away from God, and we see the judgment of God. Now, we're hoping to see a, a grand revival come. And you know, America is a mission field now. Because there's so many foreigners in our, in our country right now that we can, we, they, God just brought them over here. And we can minister to them. Starting with verse 7 of chapter 5 of 1 Peter, let's read the scripture. It says, casting all your care upon him for he cares for you we see a lot of evil in the world we see a lot of things going on in the world today and we we question and say well God where are you and God is always where he always was and where he always will be he's not absent from the things that's going on in the world it's just that man has kicked him out Man doesn't want anything to do with God. We took him out of our schools. We took him out of our government. And we're taking him out of our country uh, where you can't even say the name Jesus. You can use a generic form of God just as God because they say, well, that means many multitude things to many multitudes of people. But when you mention the name Jesus, then it's a whole different matter. People have gotten suspended from schools for mentioning the name Jesus. Uh, people will uh, refuse to receive their degrees on stage if they give any kind of glory to Jesus. You can say the word God, but you cannot say Jesus because it, it actually identifies a religion. But what they don't understand and they don't know is that Jesus is not a religion. He's a relationship. It's a personal walk with him. 
Believe me, when I, was a, when I grew up Roman Catholic, religion did absolutely nothing for, for me. And, and it, whether it was a Catholic or a Protestant or a Methodist or Episcopalian or whatever it may be, it would have all been the same to me because it didn't mean anything to me. And the only time anything meant anything to me is when I was forced to go to church on Christmas and Easter. My parents made me go, and my parents didn't go. So it was a contradiction. So when I grew up, it was a contradiction. They wanted me to go to church, but they didn't go. And so our children, when they see us, when they see you go to church and they see you excited about God and they see you, that's going to rub off on them. Amen? The Bible says here in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Now, sometimes in life, we go through things in life and we don't think God is anywhere around. But I want you to know this morning that God is right there with you. He's just, he's just a, 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 you know... It's amazing how we can pick up a cell phone today. We can call anywhere in the world almost and talk to somebody around the world right in that little tiny phone we hold in our, in our hands. And you know, God is, is even clearer than AT&T or Verizon or anything now. You know, when you say to God, can you hear me now? He says, oh, absolutely. I can hear you now. Because he cares for us. What's the reason? What's the motive why God wants to be involved in our life? It's because he cares for you. I don't know if you ever thought about that or you ever thought, well, nobody can really care about me. I'm not worthy. I'm not, you know, I've done so many bad things. I've, I've gone to so many bad places and I've, I've said so many bad things to people. But I want you to know, so have I. See, pastors are not perfect, never claim to be. But you know something? One thing we can do, we, we do have is we have a Heavenly Father that if I have a care, if I have a, something that's, in my heart, that I can go to him at any time and ask him, forgive me, Lord. And he's there ready to forgive me, and he's ready to restore me, and he's ready to rebuild me up again. You know, like I said about the fighter, when you go through rounds, you're not going to win every round. You know, let me say this. A failure is not one who fails. A failure is one who never tries. That's a true failure. But if you fail at something that will ultimately succeed, you will have success in that which ultimately will come your way. You know, you can have howling success in something that will ultimately fail. You can be successful and then it fails. And then what happens? As a sister was singing that song about this woman she met, okay, that had a PhD and had all these degrees and, and nice cars and fine things, but there was one thing that woman did not have, and that was peace. So we can chase all of those things. And go after those things. But those things aren't going to bring us peace. Those things aren't going to bring everlasting life to us. Those things are temporal. Those things are going to, going to go away. Those things are going to burn. We had a friend in school at, at uh, Bible school we, we went to. And his name was Dave. I forgot what his last name was. But uh, he said, uh, it's all going to burn. So we're acquiring all these things and toys and everything on earth. But it's all going to burn. It's all going to end up one day disintegrating. Your, your brand new car, my brand new car, whatever car we drive is going to end up in a heap in a pile of rust. One day our house is going to be so old it's going to crumble to the ground unless people, you know, restore it and build, rebuild it. But the Bible says casting all your care upon him. You have, you have, that's something you have to do. It's not something that God is, God is, you're going to sit back and wait for God to do it. God says, no, you cast your care upon me. I'm, I'm giving you permission Everything that you go through, everything that you, 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 you encounter in life, he says, cast it on me. Give it to me. As Priscilla said, the fears that she had about going to other nations, it's like, just cast that fear upon me. You know? How do we get rid of fear? Many of us are fearful about many things, but how do we get rid of fear? Well, the Bible says perfect love casts out all fear. And when you have perfect love, what does the Bible say? If you love someone, and if you really truly love somebody, you'll lay down your life for that person. Amen? So if you lay down your life for that person, no matter where you go, no matter what you do, know that God still cares, and he'll keep you, and your time and seasons are in his hands, not yours. When I was in, uh, when I was in Nigeria, when I was in India, and the times that I came across some real hostile uh, situations, you know, where I, it was very, very visible that people could actually hate you just for being American. You know, people hate us. And fear will come against you. 
But when you take authority over that fear, you say, you know what, I'm, I, I, you know, the devil says, I'll kill you. I'll, I'll, I'll take you out. And I just tell him what the word says. I says, the last time I checked the word, the Bible says my times and seasons are in God's hands, not yours. So devil, you can't touch me until God says it's okay. Casting all your care upon him. Give it to him. What's your, what's your situation? What's going on in your life? Every single one of us, every single day of our life, go through things. Isn't that right? And we go through trials, and we go through tribulations, and we go through difficulties. But what do you do with that? Do those things cast you down? Or do those things cause you to cast them upon the Lord? If you cast them upon the Lord... You can stand with confidence. See, I don't have to do penance. I don't have to walk around with my head down for five weeks and say 50,000 prayers for God to forgive me. All I can do is go to the Father and say, Father, I blew it. I'm sorry. Forgive me. And he does. That's how great and how loving and how kind our God is. Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Do you know that he cares for you? Or do you even care that he cares for you? Because one day, whether you like it or not, one day you'll stand before him. And when you stand before him, you're going to care then. And it's going to be too late. Say, yeah, but God's a merciful God. He'll save me in the end. No, he won't. God came in the form of Jesus Christ to save you now. For you to receive his way of salvation. To write your name in the Lamb's book of life. God did that for you now. He is not obligated in eternity to say to you, after you've died and refused him all of your life, to say to you, okay, come on. God's not going to do that. Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Let that be the motivating factor in your life, that you cast everything on him. Why? Because he cares about you. How many people here really believe that God cares for them? He really does. But you say, you don't, Pastor, you don't know what I went through. Sit down with me for about a half an hour. I'll tell you my testimony. And then you go, whoa, how can you be a pastor? <laughs> how could God call you? I was a wild man. I was a drug addict. I was an alcoholic. I drank every single day. I pottied every single day. I went to bars and all kinds of, well, my age, my time was discos, but, you know, I mean, that's gone. You know, I, I don't know if you even know what a disco is, you know, but uh, that was my time in my era, and I was out partying and drinking until 5 o'clock in the morning and, and just raising, you know, that word, king, well, yeah. <laughs> but something happened came a day when I cast all my care upon him. God loves us. And I just want to say this. He's not up there with a big baseball bat ready to smack you in the head every time you do something wrong. He loves us. And his grace is sufficient for us. Let's go to verse 8. Ah, be sober. This is one of the commands that God gives us. One of the things, that, the instructions that God gives us as Christians. And he tells us, be sober. That doesn't mean, that's not talking about drinking liquor. That's talking about being sober-minded, being alert, being attentive, understanding the time in which we live. Say, well, how do I understand that? How do I know what time we're, we're living in? Read Matthew 24. Read the Bible. You'll see what time we're living in. Men shall, men shall be uh, you know, haters of, of, of good and lovers of evil. They will call good evil and evil good. And they do, they do that about just nonchalant things. I've heard expressions like this, man, that's wicked good. How can it be wicked and good? In my generation, oh, that's bad. Man, that's bad. How can it be bad if it's good? It's true, right? But he says, be sober. In other words, be alert. And sometimes we're not. 
You know, a good fighter can be in the ring and he, he can have all the training. And he could train for weeks and months when he gets in that fight. But for some reason, as he's fighting, he may lower that left hand just a little bit and that guy's going to come around and bang and he goes down. Now, does it mean that all of that, all of that training was for nothing? No. So hopefully he'll get up and he'll make it through the round to go sit down and get a little bit, you know, revived and go back into the fight. And we're all going to get knocked down. We're all going to miss a round once in, once in a while. But the thing is, is that what are you going to do when you're knocked down? You're going to cast all your care upon him for he cares for you. Let that be the motivating factor of why you do it. He says, be sober, be, be attentive, be alert. Make sure that you're not groggy in these times in which we're living in. And then he says something else. He, he says, be, that's a present tense, be. He didn't say being, future tense. Be, present tense. Be sober, be wise, be alert to what's going on in the world. Just look around you and see what's happening. There shall be wars and rumors of wars, as it was in the days of Noah. I had a, I had a, a, a kind of a disagreement with a, with a pastor because, um, well, this pastor uh, believes something that's called dominion theology. It means that uh, we're going to win the world for Jesus and then we're going to tell Jesus, all right, come back. I don't believe that. And... Uh, See, we can't. See, it's not about us. It's about Jesus. He's going to come back. And my point was this. See, if you look in the world today and you see so many things are turning upside down, families are turning upside down, okay? It's almost like women don't need men anymore because they can go to a, uh, you know, a sperm bank and get impregnated and have a child. So they're kind of getting men out of the way. But when you do that, you're actually coming against God's authority because God's authority was to put man on this earth and the woman was to be his helpmate and they were to get together and get married and populate you know, the earth and have children and raise those children in the fear of God. That was the way God wanted it to happen. Now, it doesn't always happen that way, but it does happen. And God has instituted it for it to be that way. But if you look at today's world, you see that now you can have two mommies and two daddies. Okay? But the Bible talks about that. And Jesus said, as it was in the days of Lot, if you read your Bible, as it was in the days of Lot, that's what it was. Homosexual marriage was on the rise. Same-sex couples were on the rise. Back in the days of Lot in Genesis in your Bible, read it. Jesus says, as it was in those days, so shall it be when the Son of Man comes. So Jesus is coming back because we see the times and the seasons that he's there. So he says, be sober because of the times in which we're living in. And I said, to this, I said to this pastor, I said, listen. I says, you say we're going to take the nations back for God, right? Yeah, we're going to take the nations back for God. I said, then how come you couldn't even stop one same-sex marriage bill from passing in Colorado? You're going to take nations, but you can't stop one prayer. You can't stop one piece of legislation. I said, that's, that's crazy. And, and then this pastor says, well, we have to tell people what to think. When you have to tell people what to think, you are a cult. You have no business telling people what to think. That makes you God. I can't make you think anything. I can only present the truth to you, and it's up to you to go in the Bible, look, read it, research it out, find the answer, and believe it if you choose to. It's your choice. But when I force my will, if I was to force my will or what I think and make another person think that, you're a devil. I'll say it plain as that. That's why Jim Jones and all those other cults ended up in killing themselves. Because it's founded by a devil. Be vigilant. In other words, don't give up so easy. When I was a little kid, we used to have those, those bean bags. I don't know if they still have them today. You know, you fill them up with air and there's beans in the bottom of it. And you punch that thing, right? And it would go down and then it come up. 
You hit it again, it would go down and it would come up. Be vigilant like that. When the devil knocks you down, don't stay down. Don't look down on yourself. Don't have a pity party. And please, do not call me to join your pity party because I'm not going. <laughs> I don't like pity parties. I don't want to be a part of pity parties. Okay. I'll help you get out of your pity party and I'll throw you a real hot and dinger. Okay, but I'm not going to go to your pity party. But be vigilant. Be vigilant. Don't give up so easy. Don't let the enemy come into your life and, and wreak havoc. Oh, you're no good. You're never going to amount to anything. Oh, how can you do that? Oh, you did this the other day. How can you say you're a Christian? How can you say this? Listen. I tell, you know, devil sometimes will tell me, oh, uh, you call yourself a pastor. You know what? The devil told me that. Told me that last night. Woke me up at night. Said, you call yourself a pastor. I said, first of all, ding dong. Okay. I didn't call myself to be a pastor. God called me. I wasn't here instituted by man. I wasn't here voted on. God called me. See, God called me. God called me. I've scraped my knees along the way and elbows from falling down, but I thank and praise God that I'm still standing today. Hallelujah. Because I'm going to be vigilant. I'm not going to give up. I may lose a round or two, but praise God, I'm going to get up and dust myself off and say, okay, let's go with another one, devil. Come on. I'm ready. Come on. Now I'm coming to you in Jesus' name. I'm not coming to you in my strength. Be vigilant. Why do we have to be sober? Why do we have to be vigilant? Why? Anybody know? Why do we have to be vigilant? Why do we have to be sober? I'm telling you, yes, all right, thank you, sister. I've been teaching you for a couple of years, a few years now. You should know this by, by now. Just keep reading. Why do we be sober and vigilant? Because your adversary, the devil. Well, I don't believe in no devil. That's right, he's got you right where he wants you. I don't believe in no devil. Well, that, guess what? He just deceived you into thinking he doesn't exist. Go to that, that city where that man went into the movie theater and killed how many people? 60 people, whatever it was. I forget how many people. 20-something people, injured 70 people. 12. Oh, Louis knows the facts. <laughs> but, I mean, there's no devil? Of course there's a devil. If there's no devil, then Jesus lied. And if Jesus lied, then he couldn't be a savior because he was a sinner. Because your adversary, your adversary, you have someone that's been assigned to you to follow you through your life, to destroy your life, to tear you down, to, to bring everything that God has for you away from you. The devil wants to do that. He wants to kill, destroy, and he wants to rob from you. Like that woman, you know, she sang about. She had a PhD, she had, all, she had everything in the world that many of us would like to have. But guess what? She was missing the only thing that really mattered. She had no peace. Because money can't buy me love. Remember that song? Remember that, Pastor Tom? He got his hand up back there. He'll be singing it now in his head and he'll be blaming me all week. Money can't buy me love. Can't buy me, yeah. Okay. But it's the truth. Money cannot buy you love. It can only buy you lust. Hello? Reason why? Because your adversary, the devil, as a what? Roaring lion. They say one of the most fearful things that can come to a person is the sound of a roaring lion. It instills fear in you. That's why he says, as a roaring lion, he comes very loud. I'm going to kill you. That's 
That's why you need to be sober-minded, vigilant, is your, because your adversary, the devil, right? As, he comes as, he's not a roaring lion, but he comes as one. Remember, remember the Wizard of Oz? Anyone remember watching the Wizard of Oz? The Cowardly Lion? He's standing there in front of, you know, the Wizard of Oz. I am Oz! And he's, he's got his tail in his hand. And then all of a sudden he goes, Hoo! And he said, what's the matter? Somebody pulled my tail. He had it in his hand. See, he was fearful of something that didn't really matter. Like a roaring lion. He walks about. Where does he walk about? See, everybody says, well, I believe the devil's in hell. No, he's not. He's not in hell. He's right here on earth. And if you read Revelation, you'll see that he's seated somewhere in Iran. That's where his throne is. That's where he operates out of, is Iran, Iraq. And isn't it something that Revelation says that in that place, that's where those final uh, fallen angels will be released into the world. As a roaring lion walketh about. In other words, he's on a mission. He has an objective and he has a reason for being here. And that reason is to tear you down and to bring you, number one, away from God. And if he can't bring you away from God, to get you so discouraged and so perplexed to want you to, to put you in a place where you will want to kill yourself and commit suicide. Because once you commit suicide, and I hear all these movie stars and stuff, they talk about it. Oh, I hear this woman that got... Found guilty there, Arian, whatever her name was. She got of killing her boyfriend, stabbed him 27 times, cut his throat, shot him in the head. I mean, come on, how often you got to kill the guy? And she said, I, I want the death penalty because my, in my family we live a long time. And I'd rather be free because death is freedom. She's got another thing coming. Because once she, once she passes over that threshold of death, it's either heaven or hell, baby. There's no purgatory. There's no in-between. No one's going to pray you out. No one's going to get you out. Where you is is where you is. He walks about. He has a purpose. He has a plan to take you out. To do what? What's his, what's his purpose? He's seeking whom he may devour. Now, I don't know, but I've I, I seen, you know, I seen uh, Bobby Ortiz eat some food. A man can eat. I mean, that guy can chisel down. He can devour some food. See, at the banquets, and sometimes we have, like, little things at the end of church, you know, have food in the back and stuff like that. See, his plate, the man's all... He's like, Whoop. and that's good because he's a big guy, you know. He needs a lot of fuel. But so is the enemy. He walks around seeking whom he may devour. He comes to you at night. Comes to you in the day. It don't matter. Time don't matter to the devil. See, we think sometimes he comes at night, only at night, because he's dark and he's, you know, mysterious. No, he'll come in the daytime. He'll come in the form of people. Did you know that? Sometimes he comes in the form of relatives. That's true. Just don't kill your relative. And say, I, I did it because he's the devil. <laughs> you don't want to do that. But he says, be, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom you may, he may devour. So what do we need to do? What's one of the tools we need to do? 
in order to be aware of his tactics and his strategic plan to take us down. Verse 9. Whom resist steadfast. You've got to resist. I don't always resist. Sometimes I walk right into the enemy's camp. And man, I get blown away and I say, God, I blew it again. Oh, that don't happen to you, right? That, that doesn't happen to you? Of course it does. Whom resists steadfast, how? In the faith. In the faith. What faith? In your faith. Your faith that you have in God. If you have faith, if you, if you have, if you have uh, faith that's a little bit, in other words, you limit God, you don't, you don't think God can do great things, you just kind of limit God to little things, and then you want to do the great things, then you have a little faith. But my Bible says that they that know their God shall do exploits. That if you have faith to believe God, God will do anything. Oh, and by the way, thank you very much for the keyboard. We have it now. I just haven't had time to get to know it a lot. I just kind of familiarized with it. But praise God, it's going to do a lot of wonders for us in praise and worship. He says, and he resists that fast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions, everyone say this word, same. same. If you have a pen, underline it in your Bible. Let me ask you this, who is Peter talking to? Christians. Right? It's in the word of God. I don't see any, any non-Christians reading the Bible faithfully. He's whom resists steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are what? In the world. You're going to go through the same afflictions that people go in the world. You're going to have trials, tribulations. Your boss is going to pick on you. Come on. Husband and wife are going to go at it once in a while. Come on. You're going to have disturbances, arguments. That's natural. It's going to happen when you have different things going on. But it's what are you doing with it? Do you know your authority? Christ gave us authority. When I first got saved, I remember when I first became a Christian, I would have dreams and nightmares and the devil would come to me and say, I'm going to get you, I'm going to kill you, I'm going to destroy you. And I, I'd wake up and I'd be shaken. This is the truth. I'd be shaken. And I'd grab my Bible and I'd put it on my chest. <laughs> I thought it was going to protect me, you know. And I, I take that Bible and I hold it on my chest and say, Jesus, oh, Jesus, I'm scared. Jesus. You have to understand, I knew nothing about God. Okay? I didn't know about fighting and the warfare and the spirit. I didn't know nothing about that. I just came, I said, God, I know that you're in this book. <laughs> That's all I know. And God, I ask you to protect me in Jesus' name. And, and then I fall back to sleep and I wake up, my Bible would be right there in my arms. But now, the devil comes to me in my dreams. And all I do is mention the name Jesus, he shakes. I've had dark figures come after me. I had black things in my nightmares come to me, tell me I'm going to kill you, destroy you. I said, you ain't destroying nothing. I said, Jesus. As soon as I say Jesus, I said, the blood of Jesus. They begin to shake, and they run. The Bible says, resist the devil and he will what? Flee. He'll flee. He won't just walk casually away. No, he'll flee. But you've got to know your authority. And if you don't have any authority, then you're in big trouble. So you, you can, well, what's authority? Well, you look at the police. Look at a state trooper. State trooper, you're going to be driving 65, 75, 100 miles an hour. Don't make any difference. And that state trooper comes out into that lane like this and goes, you better go over. 
That's authority. And you pull that car over. How can he do that? How can one man come against a 4,000 or 5,000 pound automobile? Because he has something on him. He has a badge. And that badge represents authority of the, of, of the state of Massachusetts. And every authority, every governmental system in the state of Massachusetts is behind that badge. He has the authority. My question to you is, you're serving the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You're, singing the, you're serving the God who came in human flesh. And he said, I've given you power over all the enemy. I've given you power over scorpions and serpents, and nothing by any means shall hurt you. So are you taking that authority? Are you being like the cowardly lion? Oh, pull my tail. Don't be like that. The same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. I'll, I'll, I'll be closing shortly, I promise. Everybody hungry yet? Huh? You smell that nice prime rib, roast beef going in the oven, and all that nice juice, potatoes, and getting all nice and hungry now, huh? Verse 10 says, But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory, by Christ Jesus, everyone say this word, after. Oh God, take me out of this thing. Oh God, deliver me. Oh God, take me away. God, let the rapture happen. Calgon, take me away. Nobody knows what Calgon is. Bath oil beads. Everybody wants to get away from their problems. But the Bible says after that. After that. After that. You have suffered. Uh oh. You mean if I become a Christian, it's not going to be everything. I'm always going to have a smile on my face and everything's going to go well and I'm going to have all the money I need and everything's going to be perfect? No. Sorry. That's not what Christianity is about. Christianity is real. It's down to earth. It's real. It's not fabricated. It's not a story. It's real. It's everyday life. But having faith in God to bring you through everything that you go through. That you have suffered a while. Hmm. Let me just read you another scripture. It just put in my heart. Just dropped in my heart. Isaiah 43, verse 1. It says, but now thus says the Lord that created thee, God created you. Whether you want to like it or not. O Jacob, and that he formed thee, O Israel, fear not. For I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are, you are mine. Do you know you belong to God? You're his. When you pass... Through the waters. I'm sorry, this is not a boat ride experience. Hello? You're going to be in the water. You're going to feel the water. You're going to be tested by the water. And the water is going to speak to you and try to overcome you and try to drown you. Hello? Am I speaking to anyone today? When you pass through the waters, when you read God's word, do you get excited? He didn't say when you're stuck in the water and you're treading water and, and you're just staying still. No, there's a promise here. When you pass through 
the water. You're going to pass through it. Praise God. Hallelujah. You're going to take faith and say, wait a minute. That, that scripture says I'm going to pass through it. I'm not going to stay there. I'm going to pass through the waters. He said what? No, no, no. What does he say? When you pass through the waters, when you're going through the stuff. Everybody know what that stuff is? Amen. All the stuff you go through. He said, I will be with you. Amen. Brother Darren, when you go through the stuff, you know what stuff I'm talking about? When you go through the stuff you've got to deal with, Jesus said, I'm going to be there with you. I'm there with you. You going through some stuff? Guess what? He's with you. Oh, he's with you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I believe God spoke to me. He's going to heal your neck. I believe that. When thou pass through the waters, I'll be with thee. And through the rivers. You ever see a Colorado River when it's that full bloom? Man, that thing's powerful. They go water rafting down that thing, man, and they're flying down that raft. It's hard to stay f firm in rivers. Rivers flow. You now we sang the song this morning. Let the river flow. Huh? You want the river to flow over you? Hey, you, let me just put it this way. Rivers are going to flow over you. You're going to go through some stuff. You're going to go through some rivers. I like that song by Jimmy Swaggart. He said, one more river to cross, one more mountain to climb, one more valley that i got to get through, leaving my troubles behind. God bless you. He said, they, meaning those rivers and that water, shall not overflow you. Okay, well, thank God it's over. Hallelujah, I went through the river, went through the water. Then he says something else. When you walk through the fire... Now i got to go through fire. Wait a minute. This is supposed to be comfortable Christianity. This is supposed to be everything's all set, baby. This is supposed to be uh, everything's going my way. Hello? When you walk through the fire, you getting the word? Through. Hello? Well, if I'm going to go through the fire, guess what? I'm going to make it to the other side. Praise God, I'm going to make it to the other side. Thou shalt not be what? Burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. Why? Verse 3. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. So you don't have to worry. Go back to 1 Peter. I'm going to close. After that you have suffered a while... There's a, there's a purpose. Everybody wants God to change them, right? How, remember we sing that song, To be like Jesus. To be like Jesus. All I ask is to be like Him. Right, remember that? Remember that, Andy, that song? All through life's journey. To be like Jesus. Well, you want to be like Jesus, get ready. He says, After that you have suffered a while, make you what? Perfect. God's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. Took him just a week to make the moon and the stars. Sun, sun earth, and Jupiter and Mars. Still working on me. Make you perfect. Establish. Strengthen. And settle you. Isn't that wonderful? And the reason why is verse 11 that I close. By, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let's just bow in a word of prayer this morning. Father. Help us to be vigilant. Help us to be sober. 
because the adversary, the devil, seeks throughout the whole earth, roams throughout the whole earth, walks throughout the whole earth, seeking whom he may, then say he will devour. He says, who he may devour. We have to allow him. And I pray, Father, that people in this place today would be strengthened when they go through the floods and the fire and the waters, when they go through the afflictions and the things that they go through in life. I pray that your Holy Spirit will comfort them and strengthen them to know that they're only passing through. It won't last a long time. To have faith and believe you that you said, I am with you always, even to the end of the earth. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Father, I pray that you bless your people, that you strengthen them today. And as they go, that you will bless them financially, physically, spiritually. And Lord, when they come out the other side of their trials and tribulations that they go through, that they will be like pure gold on the other side. In Jesus' name. How God's people said. I just want to pray. If there's anyone here that does not know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I want to pray for you today. Father, I pray there are those that may not know you. I don't know what people's hearts are in this church. I don't know where they stand with you. But Lord, I pray, Father, if they don't know you, that they would simply just bow their head and say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. Come into my life. Be the Lord and Master of my life from this day forward. Forgive me of my sin, for I have sinned against you, and you only have I sinned. And I ask your forgiveness. Cleanse me with the precious blood of Jesus. Come into my heart and life from this day forward. I believe, Father God, that you raised Christ Jesus from the dead for my justification, and I am saved. And I thank you in Jesus' name. If you pray that prayer, whether you're listening to the CD or here in this church, you are a member of the family of God. Just a Your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And we thank you and praise God for you in your life. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you this morning.